Here you can see a burning dwelling in the United States with potentially trapped persons. And a recursed public information officer of the South Metro Fire Rescue will explain us the US tactic and all important background information about this incident. We will learn why ambulance vehicles carry turnout gear, SCBA and a Halligan tool, how only four crew members work on a ladder with a water tank and why basement fires in the United States are so dangerous. My name is Florian, I'm a fire officer in a professional fire department here in Germany and if you want to learn more about firefighting in Germany then subscribe my YouTube channel. All my videos are in German but you can display subtitles in YouTube with automatic translation in your favorite language. Hi Eric, uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Eric, you are the public information officer at the South Metro Fire and Rescue Service. Um, what is your job there? So my job here at South Metro is co uh, communications manager and public information officer. I oversee most of the external communications that South Metro does. Um, which includes our social media channels like YouTube, um, responding to major incidents that occur across the district to be the spokesperson for um, South Metro, and then capturing images and videos of incidents and significant events that happen every day. Okay, that sounds very interesting. And are you also a firefighter? So I'm not a firefighter here at South Metro. Earlier in my career, I was a volunteer firefighter for a smaller rural fire department um, south of South Metro's district. So I was a volunteer firefighter for about five years. Um, okay, great. Okay. And Eric, you, you told it that you, you make uh, videos from the instance and you publish them. What is the idea behind it? Yeah, when I first started in the PIO role about five or six years ago, um, one of my goals was just to uh, enhance South Metro's transparency with our community and have our um, community members have a better understanding of what South Metro does on a daily basis. And of course, one of the most important things that South Metro does is respond to emergencies that are occurring. And um, the best way that I can tell their story to our community members is by showing them what firefighters are faced with. So we're lucky at South Metro, we have um, some personnel with helmet worn cameras and then we have vehicles with um, dash or windshield mounted cameras that can help illustrate what the firefighters see and deal with when they're at emergencies. Okay, and that was the reason why I sent you an email because I found some very interesting um, clips. Um, and so I, I asked you if it's possible that we make an interview and that you explain the US tactic. and. We will um, watch together uh, a clip of a working uh, house fire, and um, then we, yeah, we we try to to understand what you're doing there. You explain everything, and I think that is very interesting to see from another country or to, to see in another country how you how you work on, on scene. And um, so my my first question is: um, There's a working fire, and um, 11 fire vehicles are rushing. To the incident, um, is this a standard for a working fire? At South Metro, this is standard for a working residential structure fire, and mm -hmm. we classify mm -hmm. a residential fire as a one or two family dwelling. Anything that's a three family dwelling or larger, we consider a multi family structure fire, and that will actually get um, a, another aerial apparatus responding to it. And then a commercial structure fire gets another aerial as well as a heavy rescue truck. Mm -hmm. So what you see on the frame here with that list of apparatus, that's our most common. Um, most of our structural fires are in um, single family homes. Okay. And um, how, how many people are uh, on the vehicles, for example, on a ladder or on an engine? Yeah. So at South Metro, every ladder has um, four personnel. And then engines, most of our engines have four, but some of them still have three personnel. The ultimate staffing goal at South Metro is to get four firefighters on every engine, mm -hmm. and that'll happen mm -hmm. probably in the next couple years. Um, medic units have two. The battalion chiefs, um, safety and med each have a single person assigned to those mm -hmm. uh, SUVs. Okay, but uh, that, that sounds very well, because when I talk to, to other guys from, from the States, 
they 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 say that sometimes they have only uh, three guys on an engine or on a on a ladder, and if you say uh, you your aim is to have four um, four people on on the engine and the ladder, I think that that sounds very good because in Germany we have uh, around on an engine we have six people. The, the, okay. This is our standard, but we we have a very different tactic, uh, so you can't compare it. But yes, uh, th that sounds very interesting. Especially having four on the ladder trucks, um, those crews, especially at a house fire, residential fire like this, they generally split the crew in half and function with two different two-person teams, as we'll see later. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why it's especially important to have that crew of four on the ladder trucks. Mm -hmm. Great. Here, okay, it's, you know, we can't see it really nice, but you can see a, a little common car. Is that the, that the car of the battalion chief? Um, in yes. In front so of, the, the, of the ladder? Yeah, the battalion chief drives a, a Ford F-150 pickup truck. Mm -hmm. That's what all of the battalion chiefs drive. Um, this this is the video from Ladder 12, who is stationed with Battalion Chief 2, and their fire station is um, just up the street from here. So oftentimes the battalion chief will leave the fire station first and um, arrive on scene and pick a position where they can best command the scene from inside of their vehicle. Mm -hmm. Okay, here you can see the... I think the name's Lieutenant. Is that right? Is that the the name of the guy who's make the 360? Ah, uh, yes, the lieutenant. A uh, lieutenant. Okay, and um, this is the job of the first lieutenant. When he arrives to the scene, he make the 360 around the the building. This is a standard. Is that right? That is standard practice at South Metro for the first arriving lieutenant or captain. Um, sometimes we have captains as well as a, a, it could be a lieutenant, depends on the day, on all of the ladder trucks and all of the engines. And at any report of a building fire, one of their um, first priorities is to do a 360 of the building. So in a case like a, a house like this, you can see that the 360 is completed very quickly. Um, but it's also a priority on a bigger building. So it, let's say they would have been responding to a warehouse fire. The battalion chief would have driven a 360 around the building to, to accomplish that same goal. So almost all of the time, um, the first arriving officer or one of the first arriving officers will be conducting that 360. Okay. And what is the difference between captain and lieutenant? Is it so each, yeah, each of our fire stations um, operate on three shifts. We, we label them A, B, and C shift. And on one of those, there will be a captain. And the captain is responsible for the entire fire station, the budget, the supplies, the apparatus. And then when the captain is off duty, there's still two shifts left. And each of those shifts is overseen by a lieutenant. So those two lieutenants will report to the station captain when it comes to um, station level issues like budgets, repairs, um, whatever, whatever is going on in the fire station. But for an incident like this, um, you don't really know unless you look at our staffing if it will be a lieutenant or if it will be a captain on the truck that day. But their job when they get to a fire is almost always the same. Okay. And in during the 360, he checks if the house has a basement. And why is that so important? Basements are very common in South Metro's district, especially in our um, residential structures. And the concern is if a basement fire is present, we don't want to put firefighters on the floor above a basement fire and have them do an interior attack down the stairs. Um, there's been a lot of different incidents and a lot of studies that have shown that that's a, a dangerous tactic. And so South Metro, if we identify that a basement fire is occurring, fire suppression will begin from outside, either through a window well, or if we have a walkout style basement where the basement actually has a door to the outside, firefighters will make their attack from the basement, not from the first floor of the structure. So that's a big part of that 360 is identifying if a basement is present and then also trying to identify if the basement is involved with fire, which would change the tactic. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, uh, that sounds really interesting um, because um, yeah, we have, 
uh, uh, nearly every house in Germany ha has a basement, so it's 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 normal. And we usually have uh, it, it is uh, brick and mortar, so um, okay. you don't have the problem that you break through through the floor. But uh, as you explained it, uh, it, then it's very important um, in, if you have such a style of house to to understand it if there's a basement or not, or, or and where are the fires, of course. Yes, and, and many, I should expand on that, many residential homes in our fire district are built of lightweight wood construction, mm -hmm. um, held together with um, glue, resins, gusset plates, um, things that fail very quickly under heat from fire. And what we've seen in some of the um, National Institute of Standards and Technology videos is that, that those structural members can be compromised and lead to a firefighter falling through the roof or falling through a floor within, you know, 15, 10, even sometimes 10 minutes from mm -hmm. the time that a fire starts. And so there's a very limited window of opportunity where um, in our modern structures built in the last 30 years or so can actually withstand the weight of a firefighter walking across the floor mm -hmm. that has been impinged with flames. Okay. Yes, and th this is a, a very interesting thing from the I, U UL. I think they made some um, some, some tests with with burning fires, and so I also saw some very interesting vi uh, videos. And uh, they they made uh, very interesting uh, things <laughs> also for for church, uh, people or for firefighters in another in other countries. For sure. Okay, then let's jump to to the uh, next questions. Next question. Um, yes, you you explained it uh, a few minutes earlier. Um, you have four guys on a ladder, and then they may make uh, two teams. That means uh, I think you explained it also in the vid in the clip. The the alpha team is the the captain or the lieutenant, and the guy behind him, and the the better uh, or not the bravo team. Is the, the engineer with the guy behind the engineer? Is that right? That's correct. So um, the lieutenant or captain is paired up with the uh, firefighter who sits behind them, which we call the Charlie seat. That firefighter is generally um, the newest member of the crew, which is why they're paired with the officer. And most of the time at a residential fire, they will be assigned to primary search of the interior of the structure. And then the Bravo team is the driver, engineer, and the firefighter who sits behind him in the Delta seat. That firefighter is generally the most senior member of the crew or the most senior firefighter, I should say. Um, so the engineer and the senior firefighter will be tasked with outside truck functions is what we call it. And they're doing things like um, VEIS, so vent, enter, isolate, search ventilation, uh, whether that's going to the roof and doing vertical ventilation or breaking windows or opening doors for horizontal ventilation and softening the building. And that that's a big thing as well, just making sure that openings can be as easily accessible for entry or exit for the firefighters inside if something goes bad. Okay. That's also very interesting for me because... Um Our team, f uh, with uh, or the the team chairman, he goes into the house for the interior attack. Always has the guy with the most experience, because uh, in in our tactic, um, we think the most risk is if in the interior attack. But you see it a little bit different. You, see, you the guy with the most experience is outside to make all the things you explained. Exactly. And that um, engineer at South Metro, that the driver position, an engineer is a promoted position, um, okay. but cer certainly not as high ranking as the lieutenant or captain. Mm -hmm. So they want that engineer to be paired with the senior firefighter um, because they'll be doing tasks outside without mm -hmm. the direct supervision of their lieutenant or captain. Okay. Then you, here you, can, you also uh, tagged it in the, in the video. You're deploying a 2.5-inch house line. Is that a, the standard line if you uh, have a, a house fire? Generally, we have two options. We have a 2.5-inch diameter hose line um, for big water, for big fire, and we have an inch and three-quarter diameter hose line um, for fires that aren't necessarily as um, intense. So it's a judgment call that um, the incident commander or the lieutenant or captain makes when they arrive, which line they feel is most appropriate. Um, with this house on arrival, having a fully engulfed garage fire, we've seen really great success in de 
deploying that two and a half inch diameter hose line and doing a transitional attack and um, seeing the the very rapid reduction in heat and flames using that two and a half. So yes, oftentimes at a fire that looks like this, South Metro deploys the two and a half. We get an, an initial knockdown on the fire, darken it down. And then the smaller, more maneuverable inch and three quarter hose line is what gets pulled into the interior um, to complete extinguishment and do overhaul with. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were in a commercial structure, um, the two and a half is generally the standard just to make sure that we're flowing enough um, water to handle the fire load in one of those bigger structures. Okay. And um, you can see also in the video that they start the line uh, from uh, the, the letter and you, you call uh, the letter a quint. Can you just explain what, what a quint is? Sure. So um, we define a quint as having five things. Uh, it has a pump, it has a water tank, it has fire hose, it has ground ladders, and it has an aerial ladder. And that's, that's the five things that make a quint. And that um, labeling really goes back to the early days of firefighting in, in the U.S. when all of those tasks were separate. Um, we're talking like horse-drawn fire apparatus days when there would be just one hose cart um, and then the hose cart might be accompanied by the pump or the steam engine and then there was a hook and ladder company and so all of those things were separate and as motorized fire apparatus in the united states became more common um, fire apparatus manufacturers would advertise a triple combination fire engine and that's what our standard engine is today so a triple is a water tank, a pump, and hose, which makes the engine. And then when we add on the ground ladders, that actually makes it a quad. So some fire departments in the U.S. were, were using the term quad if there was no aerial ladder on top. And then Quint puts all those things together. Okay. That, that's the reason why, why a lot of German firefighters love the, the tracks in the States because they are very big and you have everything you need in, in, in one one vehicle and yeah we have for forever we have a specialized vehicle that means we have a kind of an engine but then we have also a ladder but a ladder without water tank um with, without um ground ladders there, there's just a ladder to uh, as you can see it in the in the back here or in the video mm -hmm. okay regarding the interior tech um the the alpha team goes inside the house so the question is Do they need a, a house or a line or something to, to come back? Because we have a standard that if you go inside a house, you all you need a, a, a line or you, you need a, another thing that you can come back to, to the entry. Yeah, I would say that that's most of the time here at South Metro that that would occur, but not all of the time. So the unique view that this fire offered is that the ladder truck was on scene first and so they're playing the role of what an engine would normally do which is fire suppression um, and then they're also playing the role of search and rescue which is um, the primary function of the ladder truck so um, you know it's important to re to recognize too that this is just a matter of seconds that this video plays out um, and the in what we see The, the crew is wanting to do an aggressive primary search as quickly as possible to identify if there's anyone trapped inside. Looking at the behavior and um, the distraught nature of the person outside the home who didn't speak English and couldn't tell our firefighters if anyone was inside, they were going in on the premise that there was someone. And so we, we look at um, a model of, you know, risk a lot to save a lot and in that case, they, they were going in with that risk to do a primary search. And the intent is for that hose line to control the fire in the garage, and then it would be immediately going through the front door after that, um, or a second hose line off of the truck that smaller inch and three quarter would be. So within a matter of seconds, that hose line would be going through the front door behind them anyway. And their goal is to start searching away from the fire. So Part of why that 360 is completed is the lieutenant is remembering where the windows are, visualizing probably how the bedrooms are laid out in that house, 
and then they start making their way on a right-handed search towards the bedrooms to to go after those. Um, so it's a judgment call that the lieutenant or the captain has to make if they're going to search without a hose line. And in some cases, that definitely does happen. The one case where that does not occur would be in a large or mega size commercial structure where the risk of getting lost is far greater. And in that case, they will usually anchor a search rope someplace outside of the door and they'll take a rope bag in with them and then follow the rope out if they need to do that, um, assuming that a hose line is not present. But um, kind of wrapping back to, to the question that you asked, I, I think in general, most truck companies in the United States or ladder trucks, they are conducting their searches without a hose line. And especially with the VEIS, the vent enter isolate search tactic, that involves going in through a window, uh, closing the interior door from that bedroom to say the hallway, searching that room and then going out the ladder. So they are used to training for and conducting primary searches without um, a hose line or a rope, especially at residential or multifamily structured fires. Okay. Oh, that, that, that's very interesting um, uh, what you explained. And what you also, or what, what is also very important that you have a, sp a specific structure of the houses and you explain it, you only have a few minutes. And if you wait too long, uh, then you, you do not have any chance to, to rescue something out of the house. So, okay. It, it, that's just a, a, a short word. Um, they they are talking up. Uh, yes, you can see it here in the video. The Delta helmet cam. Who or what is Delta? Delta is the firefighter who sits behind the driver of the truck. Um, okay. That's the Delta firefighter. So together, he and the engineer. This is kind of confusing. The Delta firefighter and the engineer, um, who's known as the Bravo firefighter together make the Bravo team, just like the lieutenant or captain is the alpha seat and the firefighter behind them is Charlie, they make the alpha team. So what you're seeing is the view from the firefighter who sits behind the driver um, doing another kind of 360 of the scene to figure out where they need to put ladders and where there are search opportunities. And in this case, um, he was talking to the homeowner or the occupant of the home to try and identify if anyone was trapped so they could prioritize where they wanted to search the house. You see it that they check the, the window of the basement. And um, I think the the construction of the building is a brick and mortar. Is that right? Or is everything wood? Yeah, so that's an exterior brick facade. Um, that's, that's brick and mortar just as exterior siding but it's actually attached to wood frame structure. And then on the other side of the wood frame on the interior is drywall. So behind the brick is actually combustible uh, wood material, wood framing, and then the floor is also made of wood. Okay, then that that is not as it looks like. Uh, that, that means uh, you think it's brick and mortar, but uh, it's it's a complete uh, wooden building only with outside with, with brick and mortar. Okay, exactly. Yeah, it can be very deceiving if you're used to a true brick and mortar structure. Um, it, it would definitely be a surprise when you opened up the interior wall to see nothing but uh, two by fours and wood studs holding it all. All together in place. <laughs> okay. Then um, the oops. then the lieutenant need uh, another line inside the building. Um, two questions: Which team is responsible for that? The the uh, Bravo team, and which line uh, does the team use? So what um, was difficult to explain in this video is that Medic 12 was also on scene and. Um, Medic 12's crew, even though they're on an ambulance, are firefighters. They have their um, turnout gear, they have SCBAs, they have hand tools, and they actually took over the hose line for Ladder 12's Bravo team, and it was the medic unit crew that was doing fire attack. So when the lieutenant said that they needed the line inside, um, although you couldn't see it because the camera was black, 
he just stuck his head out the front door and yelled at the medic crew to move the hose line from the driveway Mm -hmm. to the front door and flow water through the front door um, before they continued their search. Okay, this is another question, but now we can talk about it. Um, the the ambulance cars has also SCBA and turnout gear. That means the the firefighters on the car can put the gear on, and then also they can work on the on the incident as firefighters. Correct. Yes. In addition to their um, fire gear, SCBA, they carry a halligan and a flathead axe for forcible entry. Um, they carry a thermal imaging camera, and they carry a two and a half gallon water extinguisher so that they can perform basic tasks on the fire ground, um, or they can just be assigned to assist the ladder or, or engine. So you'll notice in that um, script of apparatus responding to this incident, out of the 11 vehicles, two of them are medic units because the first arriving medic unit will almost always be assigned to fire suppression um, or search and rescue, some kind of a firefighting task. And the second arriving medic unit will be assigned to medical standby. So there's a paramedic, at least one paramedic assigned to each one of those, um, sometimes two. But when they're on duty, they could be still acting as a firefighter, even though they're on the ambulance. Okay. And um, is that right that um, every ambulance car has always all firefighters on the, on the cars? Or is, is it possible that you have only a paramedic on the car, which has no understanding about firefighting? It depends on where you're located in the United States. Here at South Metro and at many of our surrounding fire districts, all of the medic units have firefighters who are also paramedics and can perform all of the functions. Um, but then there's other major cities in the United States where fire and EMS operate separately. And if an ambulance was to arrive, the paramedic won't have any fire training or any gear to, to do fire suppression. So it depends on where you're at. But here at South Metro, all of our um, ambulances, which we call medic units, are equipped with um, firefighter paramedics and firefighting equipment. Okay. I think that's a big advantage, but it's the same in Germany. You have states where you have uh, co- where it's combined and you have states where it's absolutely different. It can certainly help us with the initial staffing level to carry out tasks. Um, I think this fire is a perfect example where rather than just having the four firefighters on ladder 12, we had the additional two firefighters on medic 12. So a crew of six to, to do more on scene as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. Okay, the next question is, and you can see it here in the video, uh, they use some ground ladders. And in the background, you can see in the video also a, a ground ladder, which is uh, on the house. So can you just explain what they do with ground ladders? Sure. So um, I did not include the vertical ventilation portion of this fire in this particular vlog. But what the outside team or the Bravo team was getting ready to do was take a chainsaw to the roof and conduct vertical ventilation. And before that happens, they like to have at least two different ways to get on or off the roof in case something bad happens. So in this case, they've laddered the front of the building with a ground ladder, and they've also laddered the rear of the building with a ground ladder. So when they went to the roof, if they had a problem, they could bail off either side and go down a ladder if something went bad. Um, Additionally, If this was um, a different scenario, they, they have more ladders, more ground ladders on the truck where they might be putting ladders to windows to allow the interior crew who's doing search and rescue a safer way to exit if something went bad. Um, in this case, the windows aren't very far off of the ground, probably only six to eight feet. Um, so that wasn't as much of a priority as if, say, it was a two-story or three-story building, then we would want ladders to the second and third floors if firefighters are up there and, and working in those conditions. Okay. And is it also standard that you use vertical ventilation on the, such fires, or it, it, it depends? It definitely depends on the structure. Um, in the, you know, this example, this was a first-floor garage fire, and there was fire extension into the attic. And um, vertical ventilation is especially helpful with attic fires. And if the fire is burning 
um, on the level directly below the attic structure. And in this case, it's a one-story house with a basement. Um, so vertical ventilation is a very effective way to ventilate smoke. But um, it's a judgment call for the incident commander. And it certainly doesn't happen at every residential structure fire we respond to, but sometimes it does. Okay. But you do it also in that, that uh, incident. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So after um, we conclude the video, if the video were to continue on, the, the Bravo team did go to the roof. They used a chainsaw to cut a hole um, basically over the garage, maybe a little bit into the house. Um, to help ventilate some of that heat and smoke. Okay. And then in the video, you explain that you make a transitional attack. Can you please explain what that is? Yeah. So a transitional attack is um, intended to slow the progression of fire spread and reset the fire is, is what we, we call it. So the goal is not to extinguish the fire from the exterior, um, but the goal is to cool the interior down stop the spread of fire and allow crews to get inside to conduct searches, um, make sure that there's no victims, and then take a line in, into the structure um, to, to do fire attack. So I would say almost always at South Metro, if firefighters arrive at a building fire and there's fire showing, the tactic will be transitional attack. And we've had great success with controlling fires in a more quick manner and certainly a more safer manner um, by doing transitional attack rather than the traditional mode of watching fire, um, you know, blowing out a window and then going into the structure to extinguish it from the inside out. And um, that's a, a kind of a point of contention, I think, when it comes to firefighting tactics in the US. Some departments still prefer that interior attack over transitional attack. Um, and we've just seen what science is telling us, UL and NIST both, their, their studies are very convincing that transitional attack is effective. And we've certainly seen it in person in our fire district um, that it's been helping our incidents go a lot better when we just put water on the fire immediately on arrival. Okay, great. Um, can you please explain, Eric, who is the incident commander? in that or on that house fire so in this example because the battalion chief arrived on scene first um, that battalion chief is the incident commander and right from the beginning of the incident had command but we don't always have a battalion chief on scene first so if for some reason um, the battalion chief wouldn't have arrived first the lieutenant in this video would have been command of the fire until the battalion chief arrived. Okay, and if you have uh, two battalion battalion chiefs on the scene, like it is in that case, then the first arriving battalion chief is the incident commander. Okay. Correct. And then the second arriving battalion chief can serve whatever role is needed. Um, generally, the incident commander will assign the second battalion chief either to a division, so to take over supervision of a smaller area of the incident. They may just want help inside of the command vehicle with accountability and tracking resources. Um, it's really kind of a judgment call on what the incident commander feels they need most. Okay, and uh, which is the, the next uh, level above the um, battalion chief? If, if, if it's, for example, a very big incident? The next level up is district chief. And here at South Metro, we have one district chief who oversees all activities and, and the, the entire fire district for the day. And there are five battalion chiefs underneath that person. So if this was a major incident that was escalating, the district chief would respond and could fill really any assignment necessary. Um, but oftentimes their job is what we call senior advisor. And the senior advisor will sit in the back seat of the pickup truck and just be there as a mentor and to look at big picture items. So if an incident will be stretching for hours, the senior advisor might be looking at how we're going to be covering the fire district and the rest of the emergencies happening. They might be thinking um, from more of a logistical mindset about getting uh, rehab supplies like food and water and drinks 
extra um, air cylinders, whatever needs might be present. Um, that's what the district chief will typically be doing. Okay. And um, if you have an incident, do you have different radio groups to talk together or is everything on one radio group? For most of our structure fires, we are on one radio group. And it's rare for us to use more than one radio group at, at a fire. And if we do, most of the time that's occurring at a wildland fire. And the, the geography of some of our wildland fires are so large that we have multiple divisions and division supervisors. And to handle the amount of radio traffic, each division will be given its own radio group and then command stays on the original one. So in that case, <clears throat> each of the division supervisors are required to carry two radios, one to talk to command and then one to talk to the crews that are operating in their division. Okay. And um, how do you uh, communicate with the communications or the controller communication center? Is that on the same group or is that different? The communication center um, listens to every radio group that we have, assuming we're using a repeated radio channel. And if we use this fire as an example, the dispatcher in the communication center um, is dedicated to this incident. So they're listening to everything that's being talked about by the crews and documenting that in the notes in the computer. And then they, they play actually a little bit of an interactive role so they start a clock at um, immediately when the fire is received and every 10 minutes after the fire had has been received they tell command that they've reached another 10 minute benchmark or ticker and so every 10 minutes the dispatcher calls command and says you're 20 minutes into the incident you're 30 minutes into the incident um, and that is a reminder to the incident commander how long a structure has been affected by fire um, it's a good reminder of how much air consumption firefighters are using, and it, it helps kind of shape the incident and um, kind of help them with their status reports and progress reports. So the communication center plays a, a very active role. They also provide weather information, so temperature, humidity, wind speed, and direction at every fire. Um, they're watching for lightning because we have thunderstorms here, so they'll alert the incident commander before lightning arrives that that, that danger is coming, um, and then they'll fulfill whatever resource requests are needed. Okay. Oh, that, that's very interesting, and I think it's a very nice idea that every 10 minutes you get a reminder uh, to to just understand, because if you have a lot of stress, yeah, you forget the time, And so you see every 10 minutes, oh, okay, 20, 30, 40 minutes, and so on. That, that's a very good idea. We think so as well. And, and I'll add that what is really profound for us at South Metro, some of our protection district is very rural. And so it could take 12 or 15 minutes to get the first fire engine on scene of a structure fire. And um, a big you know, alarm in our minds is when nobody's on scene yet and dispatch tells us that we're 10 minutes into the fire that paints a pretty good picture to all of us of how you know how far behind we are in this incident and especially if it's modern construction we we may already be worried about structural failure as soon as the fire engine arrives so that that time that benchmark is very very important mm -hmm. and some fire departments in the u.s start that 10 minute clock when crews arrive But here at South Metro, we do it from the time that the 911 call was received. So we're really looking at it from an entire incident perspective, not just when crews arrived. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. And uh, the, the next and also the, the last question is regarding the <laughs> fire marshal officer. Is uh, this part of the South Metro Fire and Rescue Service? Yes. So the fire marshal's office does um, several things. They do code compliance for businesses here in our fire district. They do plan review and building construction for new buildings. Um, and they also do fire investigation. So we have full-time fire investigators that work here at South Metro. And their job is um, exactly this, to respond to fire scenes and conduct the, the cause and determination and investigation. That, that's really great because, uh, yes, in, in Germany, it's, it's separated between a fire department and police department. So um, you, you leave the, the incident and you 
do not have any understanding what was the reason for the fire. And I think that, that's very interesting for you because if it's the, the, the also from the South Metro Fire uh, and Rescue Service, then you understand more how how fire um, yeah, how how they work how they how they how they are growing up with the fire and I think that it's also very important for the tactic if you understand the the fire more so that's great yeah I feel like we're very lucky to have them and they they do a fantastic job for us okay Eric so um, yeah thank you very much for this very interesting interview um, I learned a lot of about the yes tactic and I. Uh, also get, got a lot of ideas here yeah? what, what maybe I also can use in Germany <laughs> so um, yes I hope I will see a lot of further videos from you because they are very interesting I can learn a lot of and yes thank you very much thank you for inviting me I really appreciate the opportunity and if you see other videos in the future that you'd like to discuss I, I'd be thrilled to have the conversation with you again okay that would be great bye <laughs> all right bye if you want to have an overview of all fire engine types in Germany, click the video above. In the video below, you see how we call volunteer fire departments. And if you want to subscribe to my channel, click the logo in front of me.